Welcome back, folks. In this entry, we'll be taking a look at Professor James Moriarty, specifically from the iteration we see in Guy Ritchie's Sherlock Holmes, A Game of Shadows. While there have been many iterations of the character over the years on both film and television, you could make a strong case that this version, as portrayed by Jared Harris, remains the most captivating and chilling at the time of this video. Described by Sherlock as the Napoleon of crime, Moriarty stands out as his equal rival on the other side of the law, possessing a genius-level intellect that has given him remarkable success in every endeavor he's taken, whether in academics, business, albeit in the form of nefarious takeovers, and even in physical hand-to-hand -hand combat. Throughout the film, Moriarty is largely calm and composed, even so in times of stress exuding a quiet confidence that is likely a byproduct of the strong sense of control that Moriarty feels in every situation. While on the surface he is an accomplished college professor specializing in astronomy, behind the scenes he is also the criminal mastermind behind a complex web of misdeeds spanning across continents. As the saying goes, with great power comes great corruption. A genius intellect with a lack of morals is a most dangerous combination. In Sherlock's preliminary assessment of him, he makes the saying that bad people do bad things because they can. That is true, but capability is only one part of the equation. To put it simply, Moriarty is what Sherlock would be if he didn't have his moral compass plus the people he cares about to keep him in check. Fortunately for us, Sherlock himself makes known his summary analysis of Moriarty upon meeting him officially. That summary is put forth with three key traits, namely acute narcissism, a lack of empathy, and moral insanity. Beginning with the first, these traits build up on each other incrementally before leading to its final ugly end. They also give us plenty to work with in exploring his psyche and his motivation, as throughout the film, Moriarty displays behavior that would fall under these three categories. To kick things off, let's start with acute narcissism, or in simpler terms, the obsession with oneself. Given his genius intellect, it's likely that he has always been the smartest one in the room. Combine that with the considerable success in all of his endeavors, and it's not hard to see that he would fall into the evil of pride and vanity. Perhaps in no other scene is this more visually exemplified than the one of Sherlock's torture, in which Moriarty is seen admiring his own reflection in a mirror throughout his grandiose singing of Franz Schubert's The Trout, all while Sherlock screams in agony. Coincidentally, this scene also highlights another trait of Moriarty's, his sadism, which we'll get to more later. But to expand on his narcissism, we need look no further than his end goal of starting a world war for the sake of profit. With his status as a key player in the major industries of cotton, steel, and weapons, Moriarty owns both the bullets and bandages, two forms of assets that would skyrocket in value in the event of a global conflict. Therefore, it's no exaggeration to say that if war to were truly break out, Moriarty is poised to become the world's richest man. But obviously, given that this wealth was obtained through criminal means, Moriarty has kept it a secret and can never make it publicly known. So to tie this back to his narcissism, effectively this secret wealth can only serve one self-centered purpose, an inward self-validation. The fact that he was able to engineer a global catastrophe and profit from it while everyone else is suffering. And for a final indicator of Moriarty's narcissism or obsession with self, this is also seen in his strategy, both generally but more specifically in the game of chess. Towards the end, even before both rivals start their game of chess, Moriarty already believes he has bested his opponent, as indicated by his prior assertion of dominance that Sherlock is the trout, while he is the fisherman that has caught said trout. Therefore, it comes as a huge surprise to Moriarty when he faces an embarrassing loss both in the chess game and in his overall scheme. It's notable that Sherlock defeats him with what is known as a discovered checkmate, 
a tactic when a chess piece moves out of the way to reveal the hidden checkmate that was intended all along by another piece. For someone with a genius intellect like Moriarty, receiving a discovered check itself is embarrassing enough, let alone a discovered checkmate. So, just like how his chess match mirrors the state of his real-life strategy, Moriarty never saw it coming due to his narcissistic gloating and self-absorption, which opened the way for Sherlock to execute a crushing defeat. Now let's move on to the second listed trait of Moriarty's, his lack of empathy. A common trait of psychopaths which is a natural byproduct of his first trait of narcissism. For Moriarty's case, this lack of empathy is expressed via an absence of remorse for hurting others. This is clearly seen by the untold amount of suffering that he is responsible for and will be responsible for should he achieve his goal of a world war. In his criminal endeavors, Moriarty exhibits a recurring trend that showcases his lack of empathy, namely his disregard for human life. His rise to power is one that was enabled by the crimes of blackmail, extortion, and most heinous of all, murder, killing the key players of powerful corporations to take their place, with his crowning achievement being his ability to make them look like natural deaths, thus throwing off any suspicion. And should Moriarty need his victims alive, he ensures their compliance by targeting their loved ones to keep them in submission. But more than that, in his pragmatic nature, Moriarty has two other policies which play a key part in his success, his ensuring of a backup plan and the notion of leaving no loose ends. Unsurprisingly, these policies add on further to his already high victim count. Not even his allies are spared, being treated as disposable in his effort to tie up loose ends, as we see with the murder of Hoffmannsthal and many others, who were condemned to die after serving their usefulness to him. Moriarty's lack of remorse is also correlated with his sadism, or his enjoyment from the ability to threaten or inflict pain on others. Several instances highlight this, from his gloating of the murder of Irene Adler to Sherlock, to his torture of Sherlock in the surgical room, and at the end, his threat to Sherlock of finding the most creative means of ending Dr. Watson's life. But despite his recurring lack of regard for human life, Moriarty makes one exception in this trend, that being Sherlock Holmes himself. This gives us a bit more insight as to his psyche. In his first official encounter with Sherlock, he makes it clear that his respect for him is the only reason he is still alive. If we flip that reasoning on its head, we get a glimpse as to why Moriarty has such a lack of remorse for his crimes. If his respect for Sherlock's genius is what restrained him from killing him, then we can safely assume that the reason Moriarty can be so quick to murder others is because he simply has no respect for the common person. He sees them as beneath him, and therefore disposable, which again is another nod to his narcissism. Lastly, we come to the final and inevitable result of Moriarty's attributes, his moral insanity. But bear in mind, this insanity is only referring specifically to his morality, and not a general all-inclusive insanity that we see with the BBC's version of Moriarty, which has made the character quite a mess. Regarding this version of Moriarty and his moral insanity, not much needs to be said beyond his endgame. The fact that he would engineer the collapse of Western civilization through war just to stroke his ego. By turning the world into his chessboard, billions of people would die and countless others would suffer, all for the sake of bolstering his pride. At the end of the day, Moriarty is a psychopath. If he were to be assessed in contemporary terms, he would most definitely be prescribed the label of having antisocial personality disorder. That's the umbrella term for behavior that pertains to both sociopaths and psychopaths as they often display overlapping traits, and it can be a gray area in distinguishing them. But as a suggestion, Moriarty appears to lean more towards the side of the psychopath. Perhaps you may have heard of the terms a hot-headed sociopath and a cold-blooded psychopath. Both of them have an impaired conscience and inability to form meaningful emotional connections. 
However, unlike the sociopath, the psychopath is often calmer and less likely to lash out, being able to blend in socially, which makes them harder to spot. Moriarty seems to fit this bill, as you would never suspect he was capable of such monstrosity from observing his day-to-day -day interactions. But as despicable as his intentions were, Moriarty was right about at least one thing, that he was simply the spark that ignites a greater evil. As much as Moriarty can stoke the fires and stir the pot, ultimately the greater evil lies in the depravity of the human condition, in what he labels as the insatiable desire for conflict. History would prove his words to be true, but where Moriarty falters is that in his genius mind he chooses not to mitigate this conflict but to exploit it for his own selfish ambition, deciding to be part of the problem rather than the solution. Imagine all the good that he could do for the world if he were to emulate Sherlock and use his gifts to help others instead. So what do you think of Professor Moriarty from this version of Sherlock Holmes, folks? Which is your favorite iteration of the character? Let me know in the comments. Subscribe to see more content like this, and see you in the next one.